Hi, I'm Mike Seymour, and I'm really enthusiastic to be talking today to this amazing panel of world experts on virtual production. Now, as one of the co-founders of FX Guide, we talk to people all over the world all the time, and the hot topic is virtual production. What is virtual production? Well, it's about using real-time tools like the Unreal Engine to have collaborative on-set experiences that let filmmakers work differently. It may have started as kind of previous, but now there's a real emphasis on collaboration and real time. It encompasses now post viz, tech viz, uh, motion capture volumes, uh, spaces, stuff to do with virtual prototyping, uh, photogrammetry, and of course, LED screens, producing LED sound stages. Now, in the world today, there are at least 100 of these that have now come and been built, and there'll be another 150 that are either being built or being scheduled to be coming online fairly soon. What this facilitates is more than just being able to do stuff online. It's all about this move to being able to get final pixels in camera and on set. And of course, the process is reliant on real-time technology such as the Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine is the world's most open and advanced real-time 3D creation software with broad adoption in many industries, architecture, engineering, construction, games, film and TV, automotive, broadcast, live events, as well as training and simulation, manufacturing and advertising. As such, it's the real-time engine used by companies the world over. What we're going to talk about today is some of the narrative opportunities that are afforded by this technology and how roles are changing from the virtual design that goes on so that we have new asset departments to virtual art department. Again, the emphasis is not so much on the tech, but how this is providing to filmmakers an entirely new way of working that is incredibly collaborative and has amazing opportunities. Well, to help us on that exploration, we have an amazing set of panelists, starting with Sam. Sam Nicholson from Stargate Studios. Sam, how are you? Great. Absolutely great. And Felix Jorge from Happy Mushroom. How are you, my friend? Doing good. Thank you for having me. And from another corner of the world, we have uh, Matt Madden. How are you, Matt? Doing really well, thanks, Mike. Now, Matt's from Epic, and we're going to get the guys to introduce a little bit of their perspective in one moment, but we're really enthusiastic to have this discussion, and of course, at the end of it, we'll be crossing to Q&A from you. Uh, but for right now, I'd like to start with you, Sam, because your perspective on virtual production comes from, of course, the amazing work that Stargate Studios do, but also your role historically as being both someone from a visual effects post-production point of view, and an absolutely world-class cinematographer. Can you just give us a big background on your perspective and where you're coming from, Sam? I think it's been about 40 plus years now that I've been chasing visual effects. And from Star Trek, the motion picture, where we had to do the, uh, the V'ger sequence live in camera, to suddenly now where we've come full circle to virtual production to see what we can do live in camera. Uh, it's been an amazing experience. We've looked at a lot of virtual production and different ways to use set extensions, crowd duplication, green screen, any, any tool possible. And now it's come to where we have remarkable new tools that we can do everything in real time. And uh, Felix, at Happy Mushroom, you guys are obviously virtual partners are doing amazing work. Everything from uh, stuff on Mandalorian to well, a wealth of other things. Give us a quick perspective on, on yourself and Happy Mushroom. My history is in previs and production. And so Happy Mushroom was founded five years ago with a focus in creating high fidelity real-time content by using virtual production workflows in real time. We've created a multitude of tools to satisfy different creators, including directors, DPs, set decorators, set designers, and so they're the guys that we're trying to cater to, and that's what we're, that's what we're about. And uh, Matt from Epic Games, give us uh, your perspective. Of course, you haven't always been at Epic Games, but you are there now. Yeah, so um, I got 
into this uh, virtual production or what we call it now uh, to be virtual production, I guess 25 years ago uh, when I first started and I came from the performance capture side of things and my first experience into this area really was when I got to see live actors uh, become real-time CG characters on set. And the graphics were very simple back then, but uh, I saw the potential of where I could go and got more and more excited about that whole process and how we could actually bring the content to the stage rather than do it in post. And uh, was fortunate enough to come onto Epic Games a few months ago. I had worked with them on a few projects recently, uh, Mandalorian being one and uh, saw where they were headed. And it just seemed like uh, the perfect place to be for me based on my background and, and what Epic's doing now. So lots to discuss. And what we're gonna try and do is walk through, I guess, three points today. We wanna interestingly look at how real-time environments are changing, what we can do in terms of narrative structures and getting those final pixels in camera. But also I'm really keen to hear from each of you about kind of your personal experiences or what you've learned from actual productions. And then hopefully as part of all of that, we'll be able to isolate some of the new skills that you guys think are relevant to people that wanna move into this area. And Felix, if I can start with you, because I think one of the most exciting things for me about what's happening as we see a game engine like Unreal so uh, moving to the forefront is collaboration happening back on set again. And I, I say that because we could focus on the tech, but I'm sure uh, you've got some interesting perspectives on just what it means to the people rather than the computers on set. Real-time virtual production has really changed the game for us. All of a sudden, we could have our key creatives influence our sets in ways that they never did before. And so we've built and or we use several different kinds of workflows for them to influence these worlds that they're creating. Um, some of those include virtual location scouts, virtual prelights, and virtual blocking. And so using these review workflows, they're able to solve complex issues in creative ways before the day. I think, you know, addressing the real-time feedback loop is really important. Visual effects are coming out of post-production and moving into real-time. It's like being able to hear an instrument being played in real time for the first time. So that the creative participation that you're talking about is right on the money in real time. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, but just to pick up on that, Sam, uh, how is this sort of virtual production and not just previous? Like surely some people will be thinking, well, we've been previewing stuff for a while now. We use game engines and that, and now you're just playing those on set a bit, but didn't we like, why is this different from previous? Previous is certainly not finished pixels on set. And virtual production in its purest form, we're going for finished pixels on set with no post augmentation at all, which allows you to do a number of things. It, it, it's got limitations, but those limitations are getting better every day with how fast Unreal is accelerating. So finished pixels on set, photorealism is actually becoming possible in Felix's previs, I, I believe, a lot of them are looking so good, you say, well, we could use those in the show. And that's really the, the demarcation. To build off of that as well, I think the part that really increased was the render power. So all of a sudden, where previs was created to breathe life into characters through animation, we're building something that is around the sets, the environments. And so that's lighting. We're rendering and lighting environments to breathe life into them where for a long time these pipelines were focused around animation and previs and characters all of a sudden we're shifting it where now it's focused around the shot everything so that means lighting set decoration and instead of it being throwaway where people would tell me well, hey this is just previs now we're also using final assets. So a set decorator could go and they could create their library in real life. We could capture it, we could bring it in, and then that set decorator could go in and set decorate the real set, the final set. So a large part of what's changed with this whole process is that since rendering is so much faster now, we can light these sets and we could get a real representation of what's going to be created in both the engine and in VFX both pipelines. But, but Matt, if I can ask you, like how much is 
unreal the right tool here because surely for a game, the end play is the game in engine. And what we're talking about is using the engine in a set environment, which is going to be part of a pipeline, which may need to feed into things that are obviously going to come later. I mean, how natural is that fit or is it a bit of a shoehorn? Well, I would say a shoehorn, but there's been a lot of work to modify the interface because you're right. It, it traditionally is a game engine and gameplay is very different than linear content creation and the tools are different too. So we spent a lot of time working out that production process and getting feedback from people that have worked in physical production and linear content in general with virtual production because it is a different world. And in terms of being the right tool, and we've referenced this earlier, it's got to clear the bar in terms of visuals first and foremost. And, and so if it doesn't do that, then it is we're back to pre-biz or some visualization tool. So that's, that's a priority, and that's why there's been so much focus on render quality. So Sam, one of the things that's really taken off is the idea of having an enclosed studio with monitors slash LED walls uh, above and around. And we've seen that now become incredibly popular. Uh, by my count, there's something of the order of like 200 or 300 of these either being built or being considered. So I guess that's a focus of many people's idea of virtual production. But your virtual production, which has been built out of work that you've been doing with uh, the digital backlot and all this kind of stuff, it's that, but it's more than just that, isn't it? Mike, I would say that it's, it's like going to a tailor and having, you know, the one size fits all jacket that you put on and it doesn't fit your particular production. In my experience, every production is different. Uh, the, is it big? Is it small? Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it a, a music video is completely different from a commercial and a big feature is completely different from a series. If you want to step onto a volume, which is, you know, a four wall set up with LED ceiling and LED floor and walls. We believe that that's good for certain situations. You know, you go into a newsroom or something, fantastic virtual sets, the guy is walking around. But if you're on a train or you're in a helicopter or you're on a 70 foot balcony overlooking a futuristic city, all those things are different production requirements. So what we're doing at Stargate with our process through view is really custom fitting a scalable design of virtual production where the walls can roll, you have different resolution screens, you have interactive lighting that is tied to those screens, you have multiple different types of tracking inside out, outside in, and you in pre-production design the best possible fit for not only the production requirements, but how the director wants to block his scenes, how the DP wants to shoot it. Can I just pick up on a couple of things you said there? The, the, uh, the amazing work that you guys have been doing with the TrueView is, I mean, it's astonishing to me. The, the resolution, I, I hazard a guess, it's like, I think you can shoot 8K because you've got so much resolution in some of these sort of 40K stitched together images. But but if I leave that aside for a second and just use the example of the show that you worked on, which was run, here you had monitors outside the windows of a train and it was hooked into lighting so that the lighting would change coming into the carriage and stuff. And that isn't a traditional volume. That's really integrating it into a traditional set in some respects. Could you maybe just talk to that for a second? Uh, I'm actually sitting on the, the test set that we put together for run. And we did tests months before production, testing LED walls versus high definition OLED screens. And the definition we could get out of an OLED screen was so compelling for close-ups where you want to shoot the, the, the outside. You want to rack focus from what's out there to in here. Uh, we decided that if we could handle 40 4K monitors on a 150 foot long set simultaneous, and get them all to line up, which is a real trick, uh, that that would be the, the most pixels that we could deliver on set and, and offer the most flexibility from anything from a close-up to a steady cam running down a 150 foot long set, shiny tube with no tracking marks. And, and it's, a, it's a real challenge. Uh, but the, what people are impressed with when you go on a big LED wall is it's massive. You know, it's the biggest TV I've ever seen. But the reality of coverage is you're looking at a little piece of that. So you may be looking at something which is sub-NTSC resolution.
when you line up your shop. So, and, and you have more aid problems and you have, you know, it's just the fact that the virtual production technology solution should be fit to the show as a custom fit. It should not be that the show fits the volume, right? I'd like to build, build off of that as well. As content creators, it's all in the planning. So the first thing that we do is plan out the script. And one thing that I'm often, I often talk to people about is it's very similar to when you're shooting, trying to pick between a shot that's on location or green screen. So this is a new, just a couple more options. And so you, you, and when you use an LED screen, you're going to have sets that are going to be completely final pixel. You can get your shot. Perfect. It's done. But you're also going to have shots that you only use the sets for the lighting. And you're, only, you're also going to have a shot where maybe there's a green box around the actor. Yeah. Um, and there's a multitude of shooting methods that you plan for at first so that by the time you get to Sam's world, you're using this content exactly the way that it's meant to be used. And, and you know, Felix, the exciting thing is a big part of the success of virtual production is involved in prep because this is you're only as good as what your assets are when you walk on stage. And the more rehearsed you are, like in a stage play, the smoother it's going to go. So the pre-visualization aspect of using the same assets in blocking and pre-visualization in your prep phase, those can be up and moved into principal photography. And they're great there. And then for whatever you don't want to accomplish, like in our case, people jumping off a train, I can't jump them into a, a monitor. Uh, that's green screen. And you just have to accept that and utilize traditional tools and know where the line is of what you can guarantee can be finished pixels on set. And then, those traditional tools are the same ones we're replicating in virtual production. And that's the beauty of it. Right. That you're right. planning like within the first week of having an idea, you know, maybe this is a warehouse. I'm already putting a cube up and you're in a headset and you're deciding on how much of that could be created virtually versus traditionally right. versus in traditional VFX. Right. You know, well, and so. this is something that we've been predicting for years that, that you know, I remember with uh, uh, EA when we first started seeing photoreal characters, that the crossover, the uncanny valley would be breached in avatars by games first, not features. And, and the idea that games have now become photoreal using Unreal Engine is a remarkable change because now we're seeing the literal blend, which we have all been predicting for years, of feature film, linear entertainment, television, and interactive gaming. And the same assets can be used in both. And they are being used in both, both in pre-visualization and production. And in post. Production. And, and in, in post with the, gaming, the same the aspect right in post. So that's the really exciting part is that we're seeing the, the blend of these two huge industries with a technology that glues it all together. And that is what's happening in Unreal is, and I think it's brilliant that Epic has embraced the film community and is, is really making a sincere effort to move what is literally a game engine into production-friendly tools for collaborative editing on set of your environment, pre-visualization, and post-production. So, so, Matt, so, Matt, I feel a little sorry for Epic here because what we're putting on Epic's shoulders is not only we need final assets, we need a lot of them, we need them in real time, and we need them on such a vast scale. Like, I mean, you know, we used to think that if a game engine was running well on a 1920 by 1080 screen, we were, we were having fun. But now we're talking about having game engines running across, as, as Sam says, the biggest TVs in the world. How, um, how challenging is that landscape for somebody that's coming into this now? Is it that you have to do everything bespoke and write custom code? Or has the tools got to a point that somebody that's experienced can get into this and, and kind of realize this at a local level? The goal is to not have this deep learning curve if you're coming from another discipline, like, like uh, visual effects, traditional visual effects, for example. Uh, yes, there's some things that are, that are unique to Unreal Engine in terms of blueprints and uh, 
an interface that allows you to script visually, which is not something that you see quite often. Uh, but what is really most important is they're trained in uh, developing assets and, and understanding what looks good, and what looks right. And usually what we see is the learning curve with someone coming to visual effects is how to make it real time, like what Felix does. And that's what we're focused on is training those artists into a different workflow. It's not actually about just the shot. It's about building a world first because game engines are really good at building worlds. And then as this uh, virtual production process progresses in this scenario, you can actually go to different parts of that world to shoot different scenes, just like you do in the physical world. And now to Sam's point earlier, that doesn't mean you polish every inch of that world to final, but there's also tools that allow you to dynamically change the resolution of textures uh, based on where the camera is. And that comes from the game world. So it, it's designed to be optimized based on where you're looking. That's the nature of gameplay. And so we're definitely leveraging that in, in film production because we only care about where it's looking at any given moment. So we spent a lot of time integrating that kind of technology into the real-time rendering for film. So Sam, obviously Stargate Studios has tremendous respect for on-set production, but you have a killer team uh, of uh, post people. Where, where is those skills happening at your end and uh, are you finding any resistance to learning those new uh, areas that people don't have? I think our traditional visual effects artists are having a very difficult time moving into live action production on set. You know, these, these are people that generally work with headphones on in isolation and concentrate in a black room. It's like a colorist, right? The difference between a colorist, you know, in a, in a perfect environment where everything works perfectly in post-production and having real-time color, we operate three DaVinci Resolves live on set over 40 monitors, four cameras, and everything is real time. The heat of that kitchen. I try to explain to people that when I was in post, when I was at DD or some of these other studios, you get a note, they just sometimes in a platform and an email, you go, you address it, and then you return it, and then that's the game of telephone. Now, remotely, we're doing virtual location scouts with 10 people in headsets at once. They're giving you notes, and I have a team of people addressing them in real time. And so when you have the director, the DP, the production designer, the set decorator, the set designer, the producer, or the executive producer, and their people, 10 people, critiquing your set live, that's all the information you need to capture. And that's been a major focus of Happy Mushroom. We, we've developed mushroom tools dedicated to just capture notes and capture like all these different workflows that they're doing because of the fact that we're moving so many different pieces and different people are looking at things from different perspectives. Right. And that's something that I don't feel like I had visibility in post that I did learn in pre and in production. So we just were discussing the artists coming at this from one side of that equation. Um, now, we're going to leave out Happy Mushroom and uh, Stargate Studios because they're obviously, you know, kind of got this nailed. But, Matt, in your experience, when talking to either productions or producers, is there something that you feel like they don't get or are they across this technology, in your opinion? I'm impressed how well they're adapting to this concept because they're very interested in the idea of leveraging assets across multiple shows. And, and Sam touched on that earlier. And because they're photo real assets now, they're not just for previous or reference, that is very appealing to them. So now their wheels are turning. How, how do we leverage this long-term? And this, this has to be a long play for the studios and producers in particular, uh, especially for those big projects. It, it, you, unless you have a, a creative person like Sam and his team and Felix and their team to solve problems on a per project basis, if you're going to put down, you know, uh, millions of dollars for an LED wall volume, it's very hard to carry that on one project, right? And so if a studio that's making an investment, they're looking at it for three, four, five, six years to, to pay off that investment and, and amortize those costs. Likewise with the assets. Well, and Matt, Matt, to that point, to that point, Let's remember, we're dealing with an evolving technology. These LED Absolutely. walls are going to be half the price, twice the resolution. Yes. In 
less than 24 months. It's and there's definitely, there's definitely some hand wringing going on about that. When when do they jump into the pool, yeah. right? So yeah, right now the focus is on more. You can't amort an LED screen in five yeah, years. You know, in. That's why they're so expensive. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that definitely is a topic of discussion happening right now in a lot of studios. And when, when do we get it? When's the time? But they are breaking down scripts right now, whether they house that content themselves in their own stages with LED volumes or they rent them through a third party. They're definitely breaking down scripts right now to circle the candidates that are best suited to leverage these either on a large scale, more like Mandalorian, or for, for different shots where there's high value, like a lot of the scenes that you're working on, Sam. So that is definitely happening. But separate from that is, is leveraging and building an infrastructure for these assets that they can change in the future, they can retexture, they can scale, they can easily modify and use them and basically create variants of those indefinitely so they have a library to work with in the future. Mm -hmm. So Felix, can I ask you a question picking up on both of those points? Um, when you did art department or one did art department back in the day, we built sets. We were building the sets with a vague idea about the lighting, but really it would be then handed over at some point to the DP and his team who would light the set. So you'd, mm -hmm. you know, you'd know what it was going to do in the script, but you'd still have to do that but in virtual art department don't you have to be much more involved in the lighting because by the time it gets delivered to set for a uh, led installation you can't be only then starting to think about lighting so in a sense we've been talking about collaboration on set but but art department has to get really in front of this mm -hmm. so all the all the processes that that sam and matt and we're talking about right now they are replicated in the virtual production workflow so as Sam provides the size of the, of the screen and or what they're going to do, we would replicate it in our environment. And so we would light it. We wouldn't only light with the DP. The DP would come in. We have our virtual pre-lights with him. He's choosing every single frame, lighting every single sequence. And then after he goes, we put in this LED screen and we tech visit. So then we have a representation of what the DP wants and also what it's going to look like on the day. So we have ways of reprojecting what the LED screen has in Unreal back onto the physical set so that they could also go in the VR headset and look at the physical set lit by the LED screens. So all of that is figured out way early on. And Sam, in terms of lighting on set, so let's say I've got a volume that's, a, as we described it, like a four wall kind of LED volume. You mentioned already that you, your system facilitates having traditional lighting intermixed with that. But if I leave that traditional lighting for a, off for a second, you can also use the LED walls as a new form of lighting. Like you could put up a white card on the LED screen. It would act like an area light. How much is that something that DOPs are embracing or do you find that still a bit less explored in terms of uh, implementation? Well, you know, as a member of the ASC, and um, I'm really tied to all the DPs and, and this is a very powerful director of photography tool because a lot of reasons why traditional visual effects don't look great is because the DP couldn't see how to light the green screen. He couldn't see the composite. And this comes back to what Felix was talking about, about the real time, uh, the benefits of real time is that I can adjust any of us on green screen, if I can see exactly what I'm going to get here, I know exactly how much light to put through. The screens, LED screens are very bright and they do a lovely job at ambient fill. That's why a lot of the tests that you're seeing are cloudy skies and things like that because LEDs do not put out hard light. They don't put out hard shadows. So in fact, we are projecting light with projectors to get hard cut ambient you know, sunlight coming through these windows. I just want to pivot now because we've talked about the lighting, but Matt, one of the really interesting things about the difference between games and film is in film, you basically block to the camera. You shuffle um, you know, your various assets and props so that it's dressed to camera and you don't care that it's not exactly like it was in the wide shot, as long as it seems to cut, because obviously in this business, if the shot looks good, it's good. Um, but in a games world, I kind of build everything and put them where they are. And I don't per you know, moment in the game, keep shifting all the props around. 
So there's a whole different asset relationship with props, time code, and, and all this kind of stuff that is different, isn't it, in the virtual production world than it is in a, in a game? Yeah, absolutely. When you come off stage, and so that's, it's funny because we're having a lot of discussions about uh, integrating in asset tagging and time code stamping, and especially when you get into moving characters in the background uh, on the wall itself. And or if you're copying in CG characters in addition to the wall. So tracking all of that so you know what happened when and if you're going to update any of these assets, having that trail of breadcrumbs, just like we've been doing more on the animation side for years, that all of that uh, workflow and tool set has to be in, in engine for sure. Felix, I was going to say, because it must be key to you, I mean, there's a difference between playing a video on set and having an Unreal Engine on set is the fact that those assets can be adjusted and be relevant to the exact position of the camera. Yeah, so one major difference is that when we used to work with clients in a shot-based bid, you're bidding every single shot. And so now with this new process, I call it a set-based bid, where the DP, the production designer, all the creatives that are at the high level, they, they've already worked in virtual production. They already know what they're going to see, and they go 70% of it. You know, or 30 degrees of the set is all we're going to look at. And so th that's not only the information that they have, they also have photorealistic lighting. So they could also go, also, all these props are in the darkness. Don't touch them. All we need is what's hit, being hit by the light. And on the day when the DP gets to the set, it's going to look the way he remembered and that he shot. It's going to tell him what were the degrees that he wanted. And in those degrees, he has freedom of choice. So when we worked with Greg Frazier on season one of The Mandalorian, he worked with us inside of Unreal Engine. We would have these pre-lights with him. And as we're working in them, he's choosing how much of the set he wants. He's placing cameras. He's lighting in real time. And then at the same time, he's calling in the production designer and anyone that wants to tweak it so that by the time it gets to the, to the day where they're going to shoot, it's not that, you know, exactly what he planned earlier is what it has to be, but it is exactly what he remembered. And he could then be creative on the day. So Sam, does this mean that the editorial team is now evolving in a different way? Because if I was an editor, I'd be like, well, I need a close up pickup shot and they didn't have it. So how hard can it be just to run up in a virtual set and get the guys at the end of the day to knock off a couple more cutaways that I need editorially? You know, I like to think that we came out of the chemical era, went into the digital era of filmmaking, and now we're in the virtual era of filmmaking. That's to say that once we have photoreal virtual sets, objects, things, whatever's been virtualized, uh, if you need pickups, it's easy. I mean, you go in and just make it work, right? You want to pick up another line, you want to pick up a, any set that you have can be recalled. And interestingly, for marketing the film instead of what happens now, which is pre-COVID, right? Strike yeah. all, strike your $2 million worth of sets. And then the marketing team comes in six months later and says, well, we want to stand, <laughs> we want to do something on that set. Well, now we can bring those back and they're, they're much more valuable as virtual assets in the long run, which is why for television series and, and amortizable assets, this is a really, really strong hard to play because if, if you're going to do one shot in a telephone booth in London, why would you virtualize it? Right. It, but if, but if you're going to do 20 pages or five page scene, then maybe it's, it's, it's worth it. The other impact on editorial is, as Felix said, we are literally compositing everything on set from take one to f take 15, everything. And everything's done at original pixel resolution of the taking camera. So we're talking about 8K or whatever you're shooting, everything being composited live if you can achieve finished pixels. That gives the editors the ability to unlock the edit without a penalty when they're doing screenings. So you screen your movie and you say, gee, we'd like to change the dialogue. Tighten up that sequence. Well, everything has been live comped on set. It, it really opens up editorial. When we did run, when HBO looked at the pilot for the first time, they never saw a green screen. Every, the train was running. Everything, everything looked finished, 
right? Uh, because we were 90% done on it. And, and the edit, then they literally changed the edit. They adjust it with zero penalty because you're actually throwing out more material than you're using on a ratio basis when you're doing virtual production because it's, it's real. It's just as real as walking outside with a camera. There's a project, so paper. There's a project I worked on where Netflix shot a show about a year ago and then someone captured it with LiDAR and a year later they hit us up. They wanted to do a shoot on stage on a LED screen because it made more sense because rebuilding some of those sets and bringing them back and trying to make them look identical. So we went, we processed it and it was shot in the LED screen uh, environment. And that's a perfect example of something that where it just made more sense to bring in a couple props and the rest of the environment was digital. And, or and Felix, if we turn the page, all the actors are going to be scanned. Yep. Do oh. a pickup, you're going to get the avatar, right? On it's, my pipeline. It is undoubtedly going to happen where, oh, yeah. you know, the actor can be being paid for a day or two of working in his Malibu balcony at the beach and his avatar is, is doing the pickups. I'd love to discuss digital humans for a second, but before I move on to that, I just wanted to, can I ask, ask this question? Is it the case that this is so much in flux that producers are struggling to even budget it? Because if we're changing roles, we're changing like who's doing what and when things are happening, is it difficult or too fluid right now? Or is it settled enough that I could, if I was a producer that was kind of tech savvy, but obviously not a visual effects producer, be able to bid out a show reliably? You could certainly bid it. You know, and, and a lot of people are willing to put numbers on various solutions. You know, as in any bidding process, it's, a, it's an ongoing project that has to fit the needs of the show. You can go on to single volumes that guarantee for X dollars a day, you can pretty much do anything. But I think the most important question to ask from production design, the producers, everything, is what's real and what's not real? You know, there's a lot of, of variables in the budgeting equation, but certain things are very fixed. How much does it cost to make a virtual casino, right? Or how much of it's going to be, do I need the blackjack table or is that going to be real? Do I need the stairs or are they going to be virtual? How many? Well, I think these are also the workflows the virtual art department and previs are built with. I mean, that's the reason Pre previous came from a need of to bid animation. Yeah. And that the virtual art department's coming from a need to bid environments. I mean, we have movies that are like 80% CG now with characters that are real, mixed backgrounds. Like, and so that is what I really believe that the bad was created for and why we are often working with a production designer and trying to get them to give them data so that before pushing it up to for real or pushing it up to, to the VFX teams, you have the VAT and the Previs informing you in animation, lighting, and environments. And so without having the lighting and environments, it was just animation. And so now that we have the VAD, it's satisfying the, the, the other side of it. Matt, can I ask you this? We are talking about virtual production because it has a newness about it. Um, it's, you know, it's a hot kind of a topic. How long before that's redundant? How long before this is just accepted as production? What about that? Is we think that digital production is far off just being accepted as production or are we going to be having the same conversation five, 10 years from now? I wouldn't say it's that far off. I think we need to continue to develop the talent pool. I think there's a shortage of talent and, and experts in this particular area that we're all talking about right now. And to your question earlier about producers, there is trepidation about uh, putting down tens of millions of dollars on a production if they don't understand who's behind it and who's actually creating those assets and performing those shots or creating the whole pipeline and supporting it, understandably, because it is new. So I think we're definitely on, on the uh, leading edge of this right now, and we're seeing great examples of this coming out now. We're also seeing some examples that aren't so great online because people are just getting used to it. It takes time and it takes tools. I really think people undervalue the fact that you need to build a pipeline. <laughs> you know, they, they, they want, you know, if you, you put five artists, typically we're nerds that wear headphones and don't really talk to people. And then you put, you know, John Favreau and his nine other people to give him notes. 
But you know, you don't have tools. You you're in to for something. You're gonna lose a lot of your work. You're gonna forget notes. People are gonna use shotgun and try to put it in there. But really, it has to be captured in the engine. All those notes and all those different subsets and the different configurations of lighting and different configurations of set deck. So there's a pipeline that's being built right now. And in the next five years, I do see it being the norm. I just don't see how it's, how it's possible for it not to be. You know, what are your thoughts? Like, I look at it like we're living in this age of convergent technologies and we're, we're all in different areas of that. This is like railroads that are being built, technology railroads. One is GPU based rendering. The other is storage. Another is, resolution and dynamic range of cameras. The other is the software, which is converging on us. And they're converging, and nobody's really sure where they're all going to intersect, but they're starting to intersect. Virtual production, the exciting thing, is really it's the decentralization of the entire crew and the process and bringing this massive horsepower of like the AWS cloud. You know, we can bring 10,000 processors to be on a stage in Atlanta, and very few people really have to be there. That's really phenomenally exciting. And Sam, just picking up on that point, I, the other thing I find really interesting is in talking to artists and production people, especially people that have been in the industry a little time, there's a tremendous enthusiasm of how quickly things are moving in terms of new things are being solved every day. I and mean, Sam, you must love seeing that on set, having these skills kind of collaborating and people learning from each other. I have to say that on the freeway of, of virtual production, there are a lot of on-ramps. And, and what is fantastic about the Unreal Engine and Epic's approach towards this is that they are making more and more of those on-ramps with people jumping on. And so we have a, a whole new group of people coming into this industry that are real-time visual effects artists. The gaming concept and attitude is perfect for this. And, you know, we're really, really excited about having these new tools and having such a powerful tool as the Unreal Engine that moves it all together and gets everyone working and moving towards what is going to be a whole new era of filmmaking. And Matt, I guess that naturally segues to you. What, what are some of these on-ramps for people that are uh, interested in learning more? Well, we're putting a lot of effort into documentation of all this, right? Because we've talked about how new this is, but people need this information. They, they need to be able to hit the ground running. So beyond just the how-to and the manuals, we're spending time uh, creating videos, uh, on-set examples, uh, test scenes. We actually are just finishing a template project that actually has all the bells and whistles needed for in-camera VFX, so you don't have to build it from scratch. We're building environments specifically for testing on LED walls. So uh, we realize how important it is to, to have that information at your fingertips so you don't have to start uh, from square one. And so a lot of effort's going into to making that available to our users. Well, it's been great talking with you guys. And I know that there are a lot of people that are really keen to ask their questions. But uh, from my point of view, it's been uh, pure gold hanging out with you guys. So uh, thank you so much for, for this part of the uh, the presentation and we'll now flip back and have a look at what some of those questions are coming from people that uh, that are online but thanks guys it's really really great absolutely thank you Mike